Okay, that's a whole lot of crap that we went through this week. <laughs> um, here's a short list of each of the top level topics. Okay, so take a, take a skim through that long, big one, which has a list of like lots of different specific um, objectives, things that like you, you should be able to do, that you should be taking away from this material. And based on that, give a thumbs up to the topic, the general topic that you'd like to see more of, or that you'd like for us to talk about in this review session. We have a couple of hours. So um, let's try and target that as much as possible. So go ahead and cast those votes. You can vote as many times as you want, or at least for as many things as you want. Um, So take your time, go ahead and cast those votes. Sorry, Farouk, but you guys did just spend a little while on CSS. So I think that's probably why. There are more complicated things that you can do with CSS, like animations, but that's not something that we're talking about right now. Okay. Santa, huh. Um, okay, so, Based on this, it looks like the top two topics are objects and using the DOM with JavaScript. So I'd like to take the first half hour or so and just focus on objects, and then I'd like to take the next half hour or so and focus on the DOM. So if I'm not adhering to that, if I'm getting down a rabbit hole, please uh, let me know. All right, so objects. We have five big learning objectives here. Okay, so I've just pasted all of those in here. Um, so go ahead and give the thumbs up on these as well, which you'd like for us to focus on. We're, we're probably gonna touch on all of these things, but I wanna know where I should spend the most time. So this is a quick one. Just give one or two thumbs up.
Okay. So let's take a look at the results. It looks like it's mostly for adding keys and values and adding methods with the runner up being referencing from within a method. Okay, cool. Um, we're still gonna run through probably all of these, but that's where we're gonna spend the most, most time. Okay, I'm gonna start by screen sharing. Um, so uh, let's do that. Okay, can everybody see my screen now? I've got Repolit open. By the way, feel free to, uh, to come off mic at any point if you wanna jump in with a question. Um, or actually, you know what would be better than that? I'm putting it into Slack. Uh, so if you have a question, put it into Slack. That'll be our parking lot for questions during this review session. And when I have a minute, if I see something come up that you know it's timely or it's relevant, um, or just have some spare time, I'll try and address that question then. Cool. All right, so let's walk through the very basics of objects first. Uh, making an object. How do I make an object? Not too big. Okay. How do I make an object? Well, what is an object? An object in JavaScript is a collection of keys and values. Um, the keys map to any given value. A key can only map to one value, but multiple keys can map to the same value. So if I have A maps to one, B can also map to one. But I can't have A map to two values. That doesn't work. So it's a collection of keys and values. Everything in JavaScript is an object. It has these properties. Um, and that includes things like arrays, it includes things like functions, it includes even things like uh, numbers to a certain extent. Um, although numbers are a bit of a special case. Uh, but pretty much everything in JavaScript is an object, which means under the hood, it's structured something like this. So what can you do with objects? Well, so this is one way to create an object. So that creates an object using what's called an object literal. This is, it's literally the object, which is why it's called an object literal. Um, and it's a way of writing out all sorts of properties on an object all at once. But that's not the only way to do that. You can also say, This, uh, yeah, see it says this, the literal notation is preferable. Usually you don't wanna do this with objects, but there are other kinds of things that you will do that with. But let's say that we just define an empty object and we wanna add keys and values to that empty object. Well, how do we do that? If I take my other object, Let's say that I want to add a key. There's two ways I can do this. Either I can do it with square brace notation, or I can do it with dot notation. Both of these are valid. Both of these will work. However, note the quotes here. I am, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm calling this, this is not like a variable key B. This is actually literally the string key A that I'm passing in as a key here. It's a string value. That's important. This is, is the same thing as those string. Uh, it's the same thing as those string characters. Um, so let's say that I had an arbitrary key. How could I add a value using this arbitrary key to the object? Well, I can't do this.
or I can rather, but it's not going to do what I expect. What it's going to do is it's going to create an object. Well, I'll show you. Let's take a look at my other object. So it didn't take the word banana as my key. It took literally arbitrary key. So if you don't know what the value of your key is, you cannot use dot notation. Dot notation is a shortcut that works most of the time, but in some cases, a few rare cases, it doesn't work. And one of them is when you don't know what your key is going to be. So in the case where you don't know what your key's name will be, you must use square brace notation. Because what's happening when you do this is that arbitrary key is evaluating to the string banana. So this is actually equivalent to this. It's evaluating this variable, arbitrary key, before it passes it into the square braces. Whereas with dot notation, it's treating it as literally the name of the property. So this is how you add keys and values to an object. Um, Let's see, what's next? Read values out of an object, okay? You can read values out of an object the exact same way that you can put them in, either using square brace notation, or using dot notation. Either way will work. total of pair elements in the object. So you, you want to get all the keys and all the values. So there are some methods that you can call which will allow you to get all those things. Let's go to the MDN. If we go to their JavaScript reference, standard objects, this is all the stuff that's built into JavaScript. If we come over to object, there are a whole bunch of methods that are available here. Uh, define properties can be used to specify a whole bunch of properties at once. That's interesting, but it doesn't get used that much. Um, get own property names, which will return an array of, of property names or dot keys. But I want to be clear, these things are not being called on the object itself. It's not object.prototype.keys. You guys haven't learned about prototypes yet, but when, what it means when you see blah.prototype, it means that any single one of those things can call that method. This is a method on capital O object, which is itself an object. That thing that we were doing earlier, right? We said new object. This is actually a thing. It is an object that exists in JavaScript. It's predefined. And if I want to call a method on it, I would say object.keys. Whatever object I pass in, it's going to return an array of the keys for that object. Um, okay. So that's how you can get a list of all the keys. Uh, I think there's one for values too. Yep. Uh, oh, sorry. It's still in development. That's what this little, um, Erlenmeyer flask means. Uh, it says that this is a new feature of JavaScript that isn't standard yet. This is an experimental API that should not be used in production code. Don't use this yet. 
Uh, but keys is standard. So what if we wanted to get all the keys, or all the values, rather, from this object? Well, let me put this into an array. I could use a for loop. And I could build an array of the values by pushing in. So actually, let me put this in a variable to make that simpler. OK, so let's read through this together. We have an object stored in the variable obj. We call object.keys on that object to get all of the keys on that object as an array. So that's going to be an array of keys. Values is going to be a new empty array. So for each value i, we're going to push the value that's an object for that key. In other words, that. This looks really ugly um, and is not the way that you would typically do this in real life, but it will work. Let's read that and parse it apart. So we're pushing a new value into values. What are we pushing? Well, we're pushing the value in object under the key, keys i. So keys i is going to give us some key, maybe a. And so we're going to get object A, which equals 1. And so this is going to push 1. So that's how that's going to evaluate. But this is clunky. There's a better way to do it. If we have the keys, oops. Oh, you don't let me do that. Dang it, Replit. There you go. I don't know why that didn't work. Um, if we have all of the keys, we can take advantage of uh, an, a method on arrays, a method that arrays have called map. Does anyone remember what map does? Anyone want to jump in? Map uh, performs the same action on every element in the array and returns a new array. It does. And what's the property of the elements in the new array? What can we say about them? Hmm. What's the special thing about map? We're applying a function, right? We're taking a function, and we're plugging every element in the original array into that function. What comes out? A new array with the same number of properties, just like different. So if it's like map and your function was plus two, the new array would have all your original values plus two. That's right. It's going to have an array of the results, the results of whatever that operation is that you're performing. So in this case, if we have keys, then we can do this by saying bar values equals keys dot map. And we'll return that. In other words, we transform every key into the value in object stored under that key. And this is a much faster way to do that and a lot easier to read, no? Um, 
Aaron, you asked, how would you copy the key and value of one object to another while using the same key name? Uh, I'm assuming this is related to the question from the diagnostic this morning. Um, I have solutions in there to look up if you're curious, but the short answer is that you would grab the key and the value, and then you would assign them just like you would assign any other key and value pair. So how do you grab the key and the value? You iterate through all of the keys. When you're iterating through all the keys, you have each key one at a time, and so you can add the key and the value that corresponds to that key to another object. So uh, let's say, so we have OBJ, right, which is one, two, three, and I want to add the key and value D4 to that. Okay, so if I just had the one, I could say OBJ uh, arg. Uh, So that would give me the keys to this new object that I wanted to, to go through. And then I would say, okay, uh, OBJ, take on um, NKV keys zero, and add that as your new key. And then set as the value, new KV, that key. In other words, we use the key on new KV, new key value, to get the value, and then we assign it on the other object using the same key. Uh, Max? Yep. Do you think uh, it's possible to do uh, an example of that, but an example of something practical? Uh, I mean, I'm going to be honest, on my, uh, at least for me personally, I'm lost with so many keys and values and new key values and uh, OBGs. I don't know how the other, feel, the other people feel about that, but... Yeah, that's fine. I can give them different names. Um, so let's call... I mean, a practical uh, example, like if you imagine if you had two people and these two people have two qualities and you want to, I don't know. Right. So um, it's hard to give a very simple example, but these things do come up a lot when you're modifying objects. So let's say that I have a, uh, I'll just, I'll just give a short solution of that one. Okay, um, now I'll give you, I'll, I'll show you what, the, what it would look like as the output instead. So if you have a person, they might have like a name, right? Right, yeah. Nah. Uh, and some other property like uh, location, location. Uh, Cambridge. Or actually, let's let's say age. Okay. Let's say that I have many of these identical person objects, and I want to say, okay, all of you now will move to Cambridge. So I might want to set one property, which is location equals Cambridge. But what if I want to set two properties, or three properties, or more than one property at once across a set of objects? So let's say that I wanted to assign location is Cambridge and employer is 
MIT. That's not true, but hypothetically speaking, if you had a whole bunch of people and you say, okay, they've all moved to Cambridge and wor started working for MIT, I want to add these keys and values to every object. So if I wanted to manipulate all of those things with more than one value at once and not hard code it, this is one way to do that. There are more interesting examples than this, but they're more abstract, so I don't want to touch on them. No, no, this for me, at least it was perfect. I don't know for the other guys, for, for the rest of the class, but for me, it makes more sense than uh, A, B, C, D, uh, it's perfect. Cool. Because then an object, an object, so you are trying to define several different keys, yep. name, age, location, employer, right. and you attribute the values to them. Mark, yes. Brent, exactly. 29, Cambridge, MIT. Correct. You want to add a whole bunch of new keys and values all at once to the original object. And for that, you use keys.map function key. So that's what, that's what the purpose of that function that you, that you were writing this morning would be, a combined thing like that. It would take one object with all of its keys and values, and it would take all the new keys and values that you want to add, and it would produce a new object with the keys and values from both. Okay. Right, so take, if this is A, and this is B, it would produce one with the keys and values of both objects. That's what the output of a function like that would be. Object A, object B, output. And how do you read the function? So the function. So the, so the solution for that function, um, Peter, is in is in uh, the repo. I'm, okay. I'm pretty sure I posted it up, but it's it's there uh, under the uh, diagnostic for today. Should be there. Yeah. Uh, it's diagnosticsolution.js. So take a look at that, and you'll see one uh, implementation. Oh, thanks. Uh, Adam said, when you reference the value of an object, it will give you both the key and value. Adam, can you explain your question? Well, easier if I just come on mic and type it out. So, like, basically, what I was asking is, um, you know, when you're you're referencing like an object, it's giving you, for example, the value of a, which is one. Is there any way, like, to display the entire thing, like, to show oh, sure. the key yeah. a is one? Absolutely. Um, so, if this is my object, um, Matt, right? Well, first of all, if I'm just running it in the REPL. What do you do? Unexpected token. Something is bad. Okay. Uh, if I just type Matt in the REPL, it'll show all of the keys and values on Matt. But if I'm not in the REPL and I still want to show all those things, say with a console.log, I can just console.log, Matt. And it'll print out all of the keys and values. So if you did like Matt one, for example, it would show your age or, or Matt zero would show both name no, and your name? No, 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 because those are, those are keys. Like zero and one, think of an array as, as like a special case of an object where all of the keys are numbers. Okay, and they're so all, name they're all is whole zero. increased by one, right. Okay. There, there is no, there is no Matt square brace zero it doesn't exist there is okay. no zero on this object there could be um i could define key zero equals zero no problem now i have a key zero okay okay that makes sense okay right um yeah objects are a special case or rather arrays are a special type of object um object is the more general one. Um, and in fact, there are things that are kind of somewhere in between, right? The node list that we were dealing with when working with the DOM is something that's kind of like a part way between uh, an object and an array. It has some of the properties of an array in that it all the elements are numbered, right? All the keys are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc., just like an array. Um, and it has like a dot length property. 
but it doesn't have all of the methods that an actual honest-to-goodness array has. So it's like kind of part of the way there. There are more things like that. They're called array-like objects because they are objects that are like arrays. Hey Matt, what yeah. if what if you had um, what if you th had a thousand of these objects mm -hmm. that with people's name, and each each of these thousands of objects had a person's name, age, location, and employer, and you wanted to put all of them inside of another object called mm -hmm. uh, population of Cambridge or something like that. And and when you when you say inside another object, given that this is a collection of things, I'm assuming that you mean that you want to add a property to population of Cambridge whose value is an array which contains all those objects. Is that correct? Yeah, I guess so. You you would have population of Cambridge as an object, and then you, inside that object you would have a person uh, object, and that person object would have these keys, name, age, location, employer. Uh, yeah, so I could have a key on there that is people. And inside that object, there could be people objects. Ah, I shouldn't be doing this in the REPL. But you get the idea, I think, right? And then, and then, wh how would you, how would you reference, uh, let's say, yeah, it didn't. How like would that. you, how would you reference in this example, uh, person? Where does Matt work? Uh, so if you're if you're asking me, how do you find that? Matt in the array? How do you find? Not. How do you find Matt, and how do you find his employer? Well, once you've found Matt, it's easy to find his employer. You just say right. Matt.employer, right? Okay. The question is, how do you find Matt? And it's a good question, um, because it's not necessarily obvious how you would do that. Because in an array, the elements are not distinguished by name. They're only distinguished by their location, their position, I should say, within the array. If I don't know and I'm looking for a person with name Matt, I can't just jump to it. I would actually have to go through the entire array of people until I found the person that had the properties that I was looking for. So I would say population of Cambridge dot people is the array that I'm looking through. And I would say for bar i equals zero. So every in this example, everything between those those two curly braces and people that's index zero. Yep, because it's the it's the first element in this people array. Right. Okay. And so on, and you could say, oh, if you know um, population of Cambridge dot people square brace i. Dot name Matt, then do something. There, there, there is no um, shortcut. <laughs> I guess there's no, no like. If you're just using, if you're just using for loops, Matt. there's no shortcut because you have no idea what position it's going to be at, right? However, there are array methods that you could find, uh, or that you could that you could call, which will look for the first appearance of something in an array, and that makes things a lot simpler. Um, if we go over to back to standard built-in objects, we go to an array. And at the end. So if you if you have the exact um, 
match. Well, that's not going to work with an object, actually. Uh... <laughs> so what you're going to want to use is the array method dot find. Um, dot find is going to return the first element in, in an array that causes the callback function to return true. So in this case, if I wanted to find Matt, I would say population of Cambridge dot people dot find, and then I would give it a callback. And I would say person whose name is Matt. So what will happen is that this will iterate through the array and it will call this callback function on every element it finds until the callback function returns true. And when will the callback function return true? Well, it will return true when person.name equals Matt, when we found the first match. So this would return Matt. And if I wanted to get Matt's employer, I could say dot employer. Or I could just say var mat. The, uh, the array methods are extremely powerful and useful and significantly less of a pain in the neck than writing for loops all the time. So it is, it is absolutely worth it to take a little yeah, bit of time and read through those. They, they save you a lot of typing. And less typing means less, fewer opportunities to make mistakes. I, th I think it would be good to have like a short 15 minute lecture one of these days on um, uh, search, search skills or how to improve your abilities to search and find something that you're looking for. Oh, like documentation? Yeah. So like something like, like if I wanted to find a, an array function that did that for me, yep, uh, it would probably take me more time to find it than to write the for loop. Okay, well the place to go is the Mozilla Developer Network to their page on arrays. This is a page yeah, that to get there, then you have to just look through every single. No, you know, no, we're not. You know, we're not animals. We'll. Uh... <laughs> We'll, we'll find in the document. So let's say that I want to search for something. Oh, where does the word search come up? Where is the word search coming up? Why isn't that showing it to me? Maybe because I'm screen sharing. Um, exactly my point. This is what happens. <laughs> Doesn't work. Well, that's okay, because the MDN has a built-in search feature. Okay, so it takes me to, that takes me back to Array. This is an article about searching. I don't know why Command F was working. You see, this is exactly what happens to me when I try to look for something on on this on MDN, this is a, this is like I'm so glad you did this because this is exactly what happens. I go through something, I get to some page that I I want nothing to do with, and then I start looking, and then whatever I end up on W W three schools. So what's the what's the problem, Aaron? The problem going on right now is that I can't. Yeah, c Control F wasn't working. Like I'm literally having a problem with my keyboard, but it seems to be working now. Um. If you actually just go over to the side here, you see there's this thing methods. This is a list, at least where it says array.prototype. Every one of these methods is a method that an array can call. And usually based on the name, it'll tell you what it does. So find finds things. Uh, for each does something for each element, right? Filter filters your array based on some condition. And in fact, there's a mouse over that gives you some more information. But like in terms of 80-20 or like high bang for your buck, bookmark this page, this page specifically, because you'll be doing things with arrays all the flipping time. 
and you're going to want some array method to make your life easier. Could you explain the syntax on that, though? Array.prototype? No, I cannot explain the syntax on that, unfortunately. It involves something that you guys haven't learned yet. Just take it as gospel that uh, everything that, that starts with array.prototype is a method that an array can call. And we type it like that, array. Dot... Nope, nope. It's something you would call on the array itself. So here's an example, right? Fruits is an array. Yeah. We want to call the for each method. So we write fruits dot for each. Okay. It just means that this is a method that can be called on an individual array. It's missing the your array sum prototype. Um, no, it's more complicated than that, unfortunately. Um, and it has to do with how JavaScript works as a language. I don't want to get into it right now. But um, every one of these methods is something that an array can call. An array can call dot pop, dot push, dot map, dot reduce, dot keys, dot, uh, no, dot keys? Is that new? Oh, this is new. This is a new feature. Um, you know, JavaScript is a language. It evolves. By the way, Matt, who, who develops JavaScript? Oh, that's a fun story. Um, I want to tell it after review, maybe at the end of the day today. Okay, cool. Uh, Thanks. The, pers the person who, it, who did it, his name is Brendan Eich, and he went and uh, founded Mozilla. So that tells you anything. Uh, anyway, yep. let's go back. Any new questions? No. Okay. Uh, so I've showed you how to do the first three. Let's add a method. Okay, adding a method is straightforward. Uh, no, not new session. I'm going to do a new file. Do that. No. All right. Well, that's fine. I'll clear it. OK, so um, what does it mean to add a method? Well, a method is a function that's attached to an object. That's all it is. It's a special name for a function. Um, and it applies when you have something like this. Okay, so you can see that I have a property on this object, which is map, but I also have a method, which means that if I take map, which is that object, and I call dot greet, well, it doesn't actually do anything. Dot greet is the function itself. One very big idea and very important idea in JavaScript is that functions are data. Functions are a type of object. And just like any other type of data, they can be stored in variables. So when we say this is a method, what we really mean is that the function, this piece of data, is being stored in the object under the key greet. Which is why if I type mat.greet, what I'm getting back is this function which is a piece of data that was stored under the key.greet. What I then do with that function is I can call it. When I call the function, it executes. So what that function did is it printed the word hello, and then it returned undefined, because this function doesn't explicitly return anything. That's it. That's how you add a method to an object. So okay. Matt, 
adding yeah. a method adding a method to an object is just basically putting a function uh, inside uh, one of the keys of the object it's not basically that it is that that yeah, could have said so already then what <laughs> you could have said it so already then yeah i did I, i'm taking the piece sorry yeah now it's good to um, kind of understanding it now thanks yeah. very useful that's that's all it is now there are some more interesting things that go on when you eventually learn more about objects and you will learn more about objects next week we're going to talk about things called constructor functions and that's where that stuff that i wasn't talking about that prototype that prototype stuff will come into play um but we're not dealing with that right now we're talking about plain old boring vanilla objects Okay, that's it. We've created a method. We can create more methods. I can create methods on the fly. Matt dot uh, say goodbye. That's it. We've just dynamically added a new method to an object. This is one of the nice things about JavaScript, actually, that you can modify stuff as you need it. Um, that's also, unfortunately, one of the bad things about it. Stuff can change randomly at some arbitrary point. Um, and you won't necessarily be aware that that's happening. So JavaScript is very, let's say, uh, liberal in terms of what it allows you to do. Okay, uh, what was next on that list? Uh, adding a method to an object, we just did that. Referencing an object from one of its own methods. Okay, so what if I wanted to say not just hello, but hello, my name is Matt. Well, I can't just say name, because name is gonna look for a variable called name somewhere out in space here. I don't have a variable called name out there. What I really want is mat.name. So I could write mat.name. And that will work. Uh, if I call mat.greet, it says, hello, my name is Matt. Simple, right? But we have a problem. Well, let's not do that actually. Bar. Let's say that we're lazy and we just copy and paste all of our code here. Maybe we change the name, but we don't want to change the method. If I were to call mat.greet, it does that. But if I call greg.greet, he's still adding math.name. So no problem. Great. I'll just change that to Greg. But what happens if I have like 30 people that I'm doing this for? This, yes. Um, so this is a reference back to the specific object that you're attached to, no matter what it's called. See how the content of these methods is exactly the same, but one says Matt while the other says Greg? That's really useful because it allows us to define standardized behavior on a whole set of objects. And we can just have it only vary by the data that's unique to that object, such as the name. And you can use this to do lots of things. You can use this to grab a property of an object. You can also use this to call a method. 
But in order to use this, you have to have whatever you're calling in the local scope. In order to use this, your function must be attached to an object. Actually, that's not even quite true. You can call, you can call, a, you can call this inside a function that's not attached to an object. But um, some weird stuff is going to happen. I'll, I'll give you an example. Well, first I'll show you Matt Duckery. We're reading it so that it points to the window scope or something like that. It points to the object. Yeah, that's right. So there's a there's a big global top level object uh, when you run JavaScript, and uh, so if you have your function that's not attached to an object, this will refer to that top level object. When it says it refers to the window, they're saying window onload. Is that what that means? I don't quite follow your question. I'm sorry. Uh, I just was reading earlier somewhere in one of the, the pieces y'all gave us this name. If you don't define. Oh, what oh, you're I see. Yes, to, yes, yes. It goes yes. to so, download. Okay. Um, in the uh, in the browser, that top level object you can call window. Window is that top level object. So if you have a function that's just var my func equals function. And I say console.log this. When I call it, oh, I'm not allowed to in REPL it. But if I were doing this in, um, maybe in the inspector, I can do it. All right, I'm going to copy this code. There we go. So the value of this inside a function that's not on an object is the top level object, which in the browser is window. And window has lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of properties and methods. So in order to use this, I need to put in something else. You know, you've got console log this, but I'd have to have var this inside that function, my function. No, this is not the name of the variable. This is a keyword within JavaScript that refers to the object that the function is attached to. So in this, in, in this case with greet, this refers back to this object that's stored in the variable map. But in this case, this function isn't attached to an object. Actually, technically it is. It's attached to the global object. Um, so when we say dot when we call this this refers back to that global object why isn't it an object it has console log inside of the curly braces sorry say that again the console logs inside of the curly braces for this function yes yeah doesn't function. that technically make it an object well the function is itself an object but it isn't a property of an object or I should say it's the only thing that it's potentially a property of is that it's a property of the global object. But that's not an important detail. For our purposes, it's not attached to an object. It is an object, but it's not a property of an object. In this case, function is, a, is the value of the greet property for Matt. So when I call this, this refers back to Matt. Because this function is a property of this bigger object. Is key a, uh, sorry, is greet a key or a property? Uh, it's both. Okay. It's both. Is it the same thing? It, it depends on the way that you're talking about objects. Um, if you're talking about objects as pairs of keys and values, then greet is a key. Um, if you're talking about objects in a more abstract um, sense, in a way that might even go beyond just the JavaScript programming language, but it just as a high level, what is an object? Um, you might call greet a property of this object. Well, technically, it's not only a property, it's also a method because JavaScript does that. But that's not true with every language. And then when you have after the greet function console log, hello, my name is, yep. that is what? A method of uh, Matt? So you would say that Matt has a method called greet. And this is the content of that method. Gotcha. That's you know, wh how you would say it in English. But it, it all amounts to the same thing. At least in JavaScript, JavaScript objects are key value pairs. 
but in other languages they are not necessarily. And so the precise structure of how you have that stuff is different. In the abstract sense, objects are some collection of data that have a uh, private memory and private behavior. Those private things of memory are called properties and those private behaviors are called methods. And this is like abstract thinking about objects beyond the scope of any particular language. The way that, Java, that uh, JavaScript implements objects, the way objects exist in the JavaScript language is as these key value pairs. And so it is both keys and values and properties and methods. One is JavaScript specific and one is more abstract. Well, clear for me, it's clear. It's just now a matter of uh, not forgetting it. Yeah. Well, you'll <laughs> probably forget it. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, for real. Like you're going to forget stuff. That's fine. Yeah. Get the gist of it rather than, than trying to remember specific things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so Jesse, I don't want you to fixate on this. This isn't, this isn't super important right now. I'm just talking about objects as this abstract idea as they exist in programming but they have, they have their own data and their own behavior. And so their, own, their data that they have is properties and their own behavior is methods. That's what you would, you would say about an object in an abstract. And that's how you would describe them, not necessarily in JavaScript, but maybe in a different language. You guys get what I'm saying here when I'm talking about the abstract idea of an object versus say, the physical implementation of an object? An object is a thing that has properties and, and behaviors, uh, methods. And the thing in JavaScript that allows you to do that is, is this key value pair, so we call it an object. Okay, um, I've gone a little deeper on this than I think I intended to. Um, no, but we hit on all the things. So it's 440. Oh, but we don't have a lab today. That's right. Uh, okay, cool. So we've got another hour so, or, or so. So let's look at the next uh, most desired topic, which was using the DOM. Okay, so let's talk about using the DOM. For that, I don't want to do Repl.it, um, but I will use a different uh, one. I'm going to use uh, CodePen. No, actually, I'll use JS. Uh, CodePen's fine. Okay, so CodePen, you guys may or may not have seen this already, but it's a, uh, it's a sandbox for creating web pages. So you can have HTML and CSS, and it'll render this live in the browser. Um, let me give you my whole screen, actually, just because I want to give you a little bit more. Okay, uh, so that, that should do it. Okay, so we've got uh, using the DOM. So what are the things that we can do with the DOM? Well, we can talk about what the DOM is, what document is, and we can use the DOM to do things like looking up elements, referencing elements, and then modifying those elements in different ways. Um, can anyone give an explanation of what the DOM is? Give that a try. Anyone want to give that a shot? It's um, basically is the representation of HTML. It's how the browser sees the HTML code. That's precisely right. Yes, that's it exactly. Um, under the hood in your browser, 
the browser needs to keep track of all of the, the data that the HTML file indicates should be there. If you want to use this analogy, uh, it's one I like. Um, HTML and CSS, and even JavaScript to a certain extent, are, um, are blueprints, whereas the DOM is the actual building. So when your browser reads the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files, it constructs the DOM. It builds the building. OK, so what's the relationship between the DOM and a uh, document? How are they connected? Anyone want to uh, jump in? What's the relationship between DOM and document? Is document the DOM? Are they the same thing? If they're not the same thing, what's the difference? Is that the document of the document object model? Well, it, it, it references that, yes. Um, anyone want to maybe assist and help move that definition a little further along? So the, the DOM is actually like the rendering or the finished product, while as the HTML is just a simple document that acts as a, um, as a blueprint. You're correct about that, but that's not specifically what I'm asking here. When you go into the console, you can actually call a thing called document, right? Document dot. Uh, document like the foundation of the DOM. If DOM is a house, then the document is the foundation. It's like where you start from, it's the base. You're, you're correct in the abstract, but this thing specifically, this word document or this thing document that I'm referring to, this is a JavaScript object. It is not the DOM. This JavaScript object called document is an object with a variety of properties and methods that allow us to interact with the DOM through JavaScript code. The DOM itself can be implemented in any different language, whatever the browser happens to be written in. If it's written in Java, the DOM might exist in Java code uh, or C or C++ or whatever it is that the browser is actually using under the hood to manage its own operations. Document is an interface. It provides a way for us to write JavaScript code and to manipulate that DOM. So because it's an interface, it has a lot of different things that it can do, methods that it can call, um, which will translate into behavior in the DOM at a lower level. But that's why we can write JavaScript code and manipulate this thing no matter what language the browser might happen to be written in or how it was designed, we don't actually care about how the browser implements the DOM under the hood. All we care about is the interface to the DOM, which is document. And that interface is standard across browsers. Okay, so what are some things that we can do with this document object? Actually, you know, the best place to do this is an actual website. No. Didn't I have that? Mm. Okay. So here's Wikipedia. Everybody loves Wikipedia. Um, so I can call document here. Document is an object. It prints out funny in the screen, but it's an object. And when it prints out, it shows all this HTML as something that I can interact with. Document has a variety of methods. You can see that as I type document, right? All of the things here, these are uh, methods that I have called on the document or properties that I've accessed on the document at some point in the past. Uh, so there are a whole bunch of these. They're specified in the MDN. They're specified in W3Schools, if you prefer W3Schools. So if they are methods, they are functions that they are stored inside the object document. That's correct. And document, it's a 
the interface, or that's how we manage to retrieve the information we want, or to communicate from JavaScript to the HTML, the DOM. That's correct. Yeah, make much easier with the English vanilla. Yeah. Uh, so this is the page for this document object that exists in the MDN, and it has a whole bunch of event handlers, has a whole bunch of properties that you can read. So properties on document include dot head, uh, dot body, dot cookie, dot BG color, which is the background color of the current document, but that's actually deprecated, as you can tell by this thumbs down. Um, you can get, uh, let's see, uh, active elements, so whatever thing that you're focusing on, whatever the user is currently focusing on in the page, these are all things that are available to you from document. So let's see if I were to do that in Wikipedia. If I were to say document.head, gives me the head. Document.body, gives me the body. Document dot active elements. Well, I'm in the body right now. Um, so these are all properties on document. How about the methods? We have a couple of them, right? Get elements by class name, get elements by tag name, get elements by tag name namespace. Don't use this one. Um, so get elements by class name returns a list of elements with the given class name. Get elements by tag name returns a list of elements with the given tag name. Uh, get element by ID, return an object reference to that specific element. Uh, query selector and query selector all. These ones are actually really powerful because they allow you to write a selector string as opposed to, you know, differentiating between one method for using tag names, one method for using classes, and one method for using IDs. In general, I would prefer myself to use query selector or query selector all because then I have only two things that I need to choose from. Query selector, but I only want one, and query selector all, when I want more than one. The extra thing that's really cool about this is that if you are really good at writing CSS selectors, you can use query selector and query selector all in some very powerful ways, right? You've learned about different ways to write selectors to modify and, and change elements in CSS. Um, so you can also use those exact same complex selectors in query selector and query selector all to do things like, oh, I want every element that is a descendant of something else or I want every element that is a div that is also a member of this class. It's extremely powerful. Let's look at an example. So um, this thing has a div, which is called content, and has a couple of divs inside of it, along with an A and an H1, right? So let's say that I wanted to get all of these divs but not the A and not H1. If I were to describe it in words, I would say I want all of the divs that are child that are children of content. So if I were to come into here, I could say document query selector all. Oh. Dot query selector all. And I'm gonna write a selector to reference those elements. Now, if I were talking about CSS, how would I select all the divs that are children or, or descendants, at least, of something with the ID, uh, what was it called? Content. How would, I, how would I select things that are children of content in CSS? Yep, that's right, Jason. You could use the caret. So remember, when we're writing CSS, if we want to refer to an ID, we would write that. And if we wanted to refer to an element that was a child of content, we could write that. Specifically, if we want all of the divs, which are children of an element with a particular ID, this selector will allow us to grab all of those elements out of the DOM. And here they are, the three divs that are children 
of content. One, two, three. Matt, could you also do query selector quote pound content dot children? Yes, I could. Mm -hmm. But we use something to exclude the children that you don't want? I could, indeed. But this is faster. Okay. Uh, but you're right. It, there might be something that I can't easily express with the CSS selector. Like maybe it has some special word inside of its content. I don't know. And I want to use a JavaScript function to winnow that down. Yeah, I absolutely could. Uh, content dot children. That's going to return this collection. But there is a bit of a problem, which is that this thing that gets returned, this is not an array, right? It's an array-like object. So it looks like an array, but it can't act like an array. And what that means is that if I wanted to do something like dot .filter using some function, I can't. Because this, this array-like object doesn't have a filter method. Only arrays have a filter method. Now, I'm not saying what you're describing is impossible. But it's a, there's a hack that you basically have to do if you want to do that. Here's the hack, in case anyone is curious. Oh. All right, so this is a hack. You can write this down if you want. Um, you won't need to, new, to use it often, but here's what it does. If you call array.prototype.slice on an array-like object, it will give you back an array. Uh, oh, right, second argument. Zero. No? Do do do. Array.prototype. So this is what I was talking about. Um, Array.prototype.slice, call document.document element. That should have worked. Um, oh, maybe it's because children is a method. No, children is not a method. All right, let's try this. Still nothing. Huh. That's odd. Okay, I'm probably forgetting a step. When I remember, it, oh, but there is a hack that you can do to transform an array-like object into an array, and it involves using array.prototype.slice. I don't remember the specifics. Clearly. Um, so, given that that's the case, um, that you have to employ this hack in order to convert the children array-like object into an actual array. Um, it's probably going to be preferable for you to do query selector all. A lot of the time, but not always. Um, we're actually going to be dealing with this in a different context when we get to jQuery, because jQuery provides kind of a nicer wrapper around all of this stuff. And so instead of having to deal with the uh, array-like object that we get back from the DOM, jQuery is going to give us a, uh, an, its own kind of object that's array-like, but also has methods. So when you call jQuery, you're going to still call it the same way. You're going to write like jQuery blah. No. So you would write that instead of uh, document.query selector. But the difference is what it returns. When you use the DOM, it returns this node list thing, which is an array-like object. 
But the object that jQuery gives back is a more powerful one, and it has a whole bunch of methods that the jQuery team wrote in. So you can actually call stuff on that type of collection object. And it's almost as good as if you were getting an actual array back. One reason why jQuery is very popular. It allows a lot of those kinds of things to become much simpler. Okay, I'm gonna pull back up over here. Uh, so we said, um, look of an element or a group of elements, uh, reference neighboring elements. I think you guys probably have a, a grasp of this one, but just in case. Um, all right, so if I say document.body.children, I get back this array of children of the body, right? Um, I can select one of them using square braces because even though it's not an array, it's still an array like object. So imagine that it's like, that it's an object with a key of zero. But it still kind of acts like an array. So that's gonna give me just that one, that one particular child, that first child. Um, so how, do, how would I refer to the body from this child? Are there any methods on the DOM that I can call to refer back up? Parent, not quite. <laughs> um, it's parent node or parent element. One of the two. Um, so if you have any given node, any given point in the DOM, you can call dot parent node, and that will give you the node that, it, that is that element's parent. Um, the differences between uh, nodes and elements, let's just say this. Elements are actually indicated in the HTML by tags. Nodes are not necessarily. So usually smoother to deal in elements than to deal in nodes where possible. Okay, so if I wanted to go back to body, I could say dot parent element. And there's body. Okay. I can access this element's own children. Doesn't have any. Uh, yeah, it doesn't have any. First one doesn't, but maybe the second one does. No? Do any of these have children? Yeah, the third one does, content. Okay. There we go. This div has its own children. So we can call dot children on that, access its children property. And that gives us this collection of its children. And then we can go down even further and say, oh, well, I want um, second child. So children two dot children one dot children and so on all the way down the line. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Um, so, um, yeah, you can use this to go down from the body to any particular element in the page. Um, children, uh, actually, I think children gives you specifically all the nodes. Let me double check that. Child elements. Is that, is that a thing? No, it's children. DOM elements, not nodes. Okay. Uh, yeah, so in terms of doing this, we can kind of reference parents, children. Siblings is just your parents' other children, so that's not too hard to get at. Um, but there are also some methods built in for specifically getting siblings. 
I don't remember them because I don't use them ever. But now next sibling. Next sibling is going to grab the node. I don't remember if there's yeah next el uh, element sibling. So this is, is going to ensure that it's going to grab the next thing that's represented by an HTML tag. So that's how you can get siblings. Uh, once you have parents, children, and siblings, what was next on the list? Uh, reading and modifying the content of a DOM element. OK. When you have a particular DOM element in hand, you can modify it in lots of ways. For instance, use document.body. Now, the fact that I can call .body, this is special for document. Normally, you can't call .tag name to get the particular thing that you know, the particular child of a given element. The reason that it works for document is the document only has one body, ever. It only has one head, ever. But there's no telling exactly how many div or span children a particular element might have. So you can't just say dot div or dot span. That won't work, and it doesn't actually kind of make sense if you really think about it. Um, so how can I change the content of document.body? Well, I can change uh, text content. That property. Oh, God damn. Something's capturing my mouse, and I think it's Zoom. So I just uh, completely blew away Wikipedia just now. Um, and I set the uh, content of the body to blah. Great. Um, now let's say that I want to add a div the word blah, or maybe a paragraph. Let's use a paragraph instead. Oh, hmm, that didn't do what I expected. Well, the reason is that text content takes what you say as literal text. If you write something that looks like HTML in text content, you're out of luck, because the browser is going to treat that as pure text. The only way for that to get parsed as HTML is to use the inner HTML property. Now there's actually a paragraph there. And there are a handful of other methods that you can use, or properties rather, to, um, to change the content of an element, but it kind of boils down basically to just those two, pure text and HTML. Hey Matt, just a quick question on this. Yep. Uh, not directly to do with this, but would the, would the um, constructing a website just based on JavaScript, would it be a way of protecting your codes? Can you explain what you mean? Like, you know, we can go to a website and kind of copy paste the HTML and the CSS of the website, right? Yes. Can we also do that with the JavaScript that is behind in, that is yes. running in the page? Yes, you can. You can copy JavaScript. Um, when you're requesting a page, your browser needs to have a copy of the HTML, a copy of the CSS, and a copy of the JavaScript for that page in order to construct the DOM. And so, that means that every time that you load a page, you are downloading a copy of the JavaScript code for that page, um, and your browser already has it. So what prevents, I know this is a different topic, Nothing. but if it is strong. Nothing prevents it. That's why putting stuff in your JavaScript is inherently insecure. Um, there, there are certain things that you should never, ever, ever, ever put in your JavaScript code um, as hard-coded values. Well, what does it mean, hard-coded values? Hard-coded values means you literally like write the value out somewhere in your code. Like passwords, logins? Yes, for instance, passwords. Never, ever, ever do this. Is that your password for Facebook? <laughs> you know what's is that funny? Why, is that why we are using then a, a connection to a database that is secure to secure yes. those? Whatever appears on the front end, the user can do whatever they want with it, within reason. 
there are certain things you can prevent them from doing. But if they're really, really determined, sometimes they can break stuff. The back end is totally isolated. They can't touch that. And so you can have sensitive information on your back end that you can't have on your front end. Now, there are ways within JavaScript to prevent certain values from becoming accessible. We're not going to talk about those right now because they're complicated. And they relate to a specific feature of the JavaScript programming language that, in my opinion, is one of the toughest to understand. Um, and it's called closure. There are three topics in JavaScript that I think are capital H hard, maybe four. One of those is closures. One of those is the event loop, which is how JavaScript works asynchronously. Um, one of those is prototypes and prototypal inheritance. Actually, I'd say three. Those are the three big ones. The fourth one isn't so bad. So those three big things are some of the biggest, hardest ideas in JavaScript. Can, can you repeat them? Closure? Yep. Closure, C-L-O-S-U-R-E. Closures, I should say. I'll just type them out. Yeah, we just like thanks. I would say those are the three hardest ideas in JavaScript. Um, and we're not really going to touch on them right now. You'll learn them eventually. Um, in fact, you're starting to learn about the third one a little bit, the event loop. The event loop is the way that JavaScript handles asynchronous events, things like button clicks or mouse movements. No telling when those things are going to happen, but you want to be able to trigger stuff when they do. There is a mechanism that JavaScript uses to actually figure out what to run and when, and it's called the event loop, something that the browser does. Um, maybe I will give you guys a link to a good video on it, but there is a good video on it. It's called What the Heck is the Event Loop? This one. It's a little early. But I still think it's, it's worth watching. You can watch it again later when you've learned a little bit more. But like that's, that's, it's a huge important idea in JavaScript and it underpins pretty much everything. Um, because there's a dirty secret about JavaScript. Um, a lie that we've told you. We didn't tell you that we were telling you a lie, but uh, it was a lie that we made by omission. Um, and we sort of let you just tacitly assume things were one way, when in fact they are not. Um, I knew it. That was, that's, what, that's why it was not making sense in my head. I knew uh, it. Yes. Lies. <laughs> All the lies. Um, so this, this lie that I'm telling you is that if you have two lines of code, the second line runs after the first line. That's a lie. And there's a reason. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> clever. Um, so there's a, there's a reason that that's a lie. Um, and it's that JavaScript doesn't wait for a command to finish before it starts the next one. Which means that if you start a long process first and then a short process second, the second process can finish before the first one does. That's a little scary. Actually, it's very scary. But it's a core feature of the way that JavaScript works. You don't have to worry Is about that without, a, without a callback? Uh, no. But you're on the right track. Callbacks are related very intimately to asynchronous behavior. That's how you set the time between the different uh, things running? Yeah, so when we had set timer, what was going on is that we were actually taking a callback that was going to run in the event that the timer reaches a certain value. The browser has its own clock that it keeps, and it can keep track of when the clock is equal to a certain value. When it does, it can fire a callback that we've given it in advance. 
in a way, it's a kind of event handling, except it's, it's an event that's related to the entire browser and not just a particular element. So don't worry, don't worry too much about that right now, because the fact is that with the code that you're currently writing, pretty much all of the things that all the lines of code that you're writing are, are fast. They're going to execute in you know, a, a tiny fraction of a second. And so it doesn't really matter that the first line doesn't necessarily finish before the second line begins, because they're all just happening so quickly anyway that it's, it's almost as if they're waiting for each other. But they're not. And that comes into play in very interesting ways when you start running code that takes a long time to execute such as getting data from a server. That process can take a very long time. It might even take multiple attempts. In that case, JavaScript might start it and then go off and do something else. So that's why I say this is such an important idea in JavaScript and you're, gonna, you're just barely dipping your toe into it right now, thinking about event handlers because event handlers are, are a consequence of this type of behavior through the event loop. Yeah, I think it was Mark who said uh, to me, um, and um, I forgot her name at lunchtime. She's going to kill me. Uh, to Zarella. Uh, we were at lunchtime with Mark, and he was saying, like, if it, was not, if it wasn't this feature of uh, JavaScript, it wouldn't even be possible to run you know, that uh, progress bar when we are waiting for, for instance, for a booking to be done. That's right. That's right. Um, in other words, he's saying that the timeout thing that I was running with the countdown, um, it was using events. Specifically, it was setting an event handler for when clock value equals blah, run this callback. When clock value equals blah, run this callback. And it just kept doing that over and over and over again for bigger and bigger and bigger values of time. It's crazy, right? Yeah, so basically, that's what brings the dy dynamics to the websites. So almost lots of things in JavaScript are, are asynchronous, or they're about dealing with things that are asynchronous that can happen at any time without warning. Um, because JavaScript was designed to respond to things. In that way, it's kind of not even so much a bug as like a feature that it does this thing. Um, because JavaScript's purpose, JavaScript was conceived to be a language for handling interaction in the browser with users doing God knows what at whatever time. So the ability to just sort of jump in and start running a code, running some code at any particular moment is kind of useful. <laughs> exactly. Users, oh, they're the worst. Um, yeah, so uh, that was a, a bit of a rabbit hole, but I think it's a useful one. Um, thinking about some big ideas in JavaScript. Um, this is the stuff that will like squeeze your brain and, uh, and extract a very, very fine powder from it. Um, it will um, be very difficult conceptually to grasp some of these things, um, but you will eventually. Okay, so we were talking about modifying the DOM. Uh, we have a little bit longer, so I'm just going to run through one or two more things. So modifying the DOM, we showed inner HTML and text content and so on. So what about setting event handlers? Well, there's two ways we can do it. We can do it either by defining a property on the element or by using a method. Um, either will work. I can say uh, body dot on click equals some function oh not body document dot body excuse me There we go. So what did we just do? If we weren't talking about the DOM and event handlers, what did we just do?
let's say that I was writing some other values here. Are there any parallels? What are we doing? What are the similarities between this and this? Are they related? Are they not related? What's going on in the first one? What is this? Someone jump in. What is happening in this line? So when there is a click on the part of the body, he retrieves a function mm -hmm. that logs in the browser. Click. That's right. There's so what are we doing when we do that? What is the what what process is happening here? What are we doing? We we are adding a method. Yes. Yes, we are defining a method. <laughs> That's right. We're defining a method on that element, on body. We're giving body a method called on click. Well, sort of. It's a little more complicated than that, but for all intents and purposes, that <sighs> is what's going on. Um, so, what happens if we click? Shows text in the console. That's our click handler at work. It doesn't know when we're going to click, but whenever we click, it runs that console.log command. That's an example of asynchronous behavior. There's no telling how long it's going to be between one time when it prints click and the next time it prints click. It could be a second, it could be a year. There's no way to know. Probably not a year, but you know what I mean. That when people are talking about asynchronous, things that are asynchronous, that's what they mean. Things that are synchronous happen regular at a consistent time. Um, and if you want to get really technical, they happen at a time that's in sync with the computer's clock. Um, which is why they're called synchronous. They're synchronized to the clock. Um, but asynchronous events happen whenever. And because of that, you need to be able to sort of respond to those things when they come up. The event loop is JavaScript's procedure for dealing with asynchronous events. So I strongly recommend watching that video. Um, you're not going to understand it all now, but uh, you should watch it anyway and then watch it again after you've learned a little bit more, and then watch it again, because it's a very important and very meaningful idea. Okay, um, so we've just added an event handler. And what else was left in the DOM? Oh, uh, create an event handler which pulls data from or modifies the element that it's attached to. Okay, let's, um, let's do that. Instead of on clicking and just printing click, let's do something more interesting. Let's change the content of the body. Copy Lauren Ipsum. Okay, so here's a bunch of Lorem Ipsum nonsense text. Where I'm getting it's not important. In fact, the whole idea is that it doesn't matter. Um, so I'm going to change the content of this page to include 
a P tag. <laughs> but I'm not going to do it now. No, oh, it doesn't like that. What doesn't it like? Probably that. Yep, that worked. OK, great. Um, so did the content of the body change? No. We defined an, uh, an event handler that will trigger that change in response to a click. But it's not going to change yet. It's going to wait. It's going to wait indefinitely. Bam. OK. So what we just did is we have an event handler on this element, which responded to a click by changing the DOM. This is kind of like the, the fundamental thing that you do with the DOM, right? You have, you have uh, event. There's really only two categories of things that you do with the DOM. You respond to events in the DOM and you initiate changes in the DOM. Um, or uh, if I want to like sum it up in five words, you handle or you draw. One of the two. Event handlers respond to events, and everything else that you do with the DOM pretty much is going to be showing stuff. Not, it's not truly 100%, but it's most of it. Occasionally, you'll be reading values out of the DOM, but most of your data is going to live in your JavaScript, not in your HTML. So you're not going to be reading all that often. But you will sometimes. So I guess three things. You read from the DOM, you write to the DOM, you respond to events. That's the entirety of DOM manipulation. Okay. Now, what's interesting about this is that I was referencing document.body, right? But what if I wanted to attach this event handler to something other than the body? What if I wanted to attach it to a p tag? And I still wanted it to change the inner HTML of that p tag. What can I replace this with? So that no matter where I put this handler function, in fact, I'm going to put, I'm going to call it. Uh, handler, so that no matter what object I attach this handler to as, a, as a, an event handler, it will always refer to that specific object. Get element? No. That's right, Eric. It's our old friend. This. Why? Why is it this? Explain. Uh, it'll always refer to the uh, or to the object in which the handler was called upon. Not that it was strictly called upon; that it's attached to. Right? Attached to. Yeah. When you have a function that's attached to an object, it's a property of an object. This will refer back to the object that it's right. attached to. Right. And so if I were to take document.body.onclick equals handler. When handler, what, what function, uh, what object is this function attached to? Uh, document.body. That's right. When we did this, we attached this function to document.body under the property name on click. Cool. But we could have done something else. We could have, uh, I wanted to create something else in the DOM. A 
say I create three divs. Okay. Okay. Now, what if I want to click handler? Actually, I'm going to change the, the style property on each of these first. I want to change some style properties on the children. Specifically, I want them to have um, a height and width of 100 pixels each. And I want their background color to be red. How can I do that here? How do I change the styling of these elements? Dot add style. Not quite, almost. Dot style. Dot style. It's a property on the element. Dot style. And to change a specific feature of the style, you can say dot style dot background color. And I think you want to put red inside some cool. Oh, good call. Thank you very much. Okay, so this is going to take all of those and set their properties. I'm going to actually do one more property, which is going to be um, margin. I'm going to set it to 10 pixels. OK, so this should iterate through all of the children of the body, which are three divs. Set the background color to red, height to 100, width to 100, and margin to 10 pixels. Let's see if I know what I'm talking about. OK, I do. Yes. Excellent. I have to always check on that. Um, cool. So now we have these three divs. But what if we wanted to add a handler to that? Well, we could use the same approach. If I define a handler, and uh, I say it's called get bigger, uh, no, sorry. All right, so I define this get bigger function. And now, for every one of these elements, I can set an on click property of get bigger. All right, let's see what happens. Oh, crap. I forgot to get rid of the one on body. <laughs> Shit. Uh, oh, that ruins everything. Um, one second. OK.
There we go. That should fix that. Ta-da! Div gets bigger. How about this one? Ta-da! Ta-da! Okay, so what we did is we added the same function, the same function as a property to all three objects. But we didn't have to change the code. Why didn't we have to change the code? Jesse, you've actually answered my question. <coughs> and someone else also answer. Could you slack us that code? Or like, I just want it for my notes. Would you be able to do that? Yeah, sure. I'll put it in right now. So basic, basically, the onClick the on -click method or function was already there attached and you just make it work in the document body children which are the divs mm -hmm. and this method was making was that on a click make them bigger correct so when you click on the divs that are the document dot body dot children times free because you have a loop of an eye between zero and uh, smaller than free, it makes for the, it makes them uh, on the free uh, squares. Yes, that's correct. But why didn't we have to change any code inside the function? Why were we able to attach the same function to all three objects? Can you show the web page again? You have the slack on the top of it. Ah, oh, you are, sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. Baruch, you have also answered my question. Can someone else answer my question? What is it? What is it that allows this to be possible? Thank you, Zarella. Yes, Jesse. Wonderful. This, precisely. It's a little ridiculous, I know. Um, yes, this is what makes it all possible. The keyword this means that this function is going to apply its own behavior to whatever object it's attached to which means we don't need to redefine it. We can take that one function and put it on any object, dozens of objects. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, so let's, let's talk ideas. <laughs> maybe, maybe Giphy's in party time, maybe. <laughs> um, cool. So, um, can anyone explain back to me what we just did? What just happened here? What's going on in the code snippet that I pasted up there? Can someone explain it to me in English or in your language of choice? while I format this code. I'm sorry? I, I can't hear clearly from whoever's mic is on. If that's you talking, then I think, I'll just be I think that he doesn't know his mic's on. Oh, okay. Okay, um, can anyone explain what's going on in the code snippet here? I will give it a shot. Please. Oakley doakley. Um, <clears throat> uh, you put one, two, three divs um, on, onto the body. Mm -hmm. And then you looped through three times and selected um, the first three children of the body, which in this case are going to be the three divs you created earlier. Uh -huh. And you set their background color, height, width, margin. Um, you created a function called get bigger, which is going to set the height and width of this 
whatever this may be, and read on, we find out what this is. You loop through three times, and you again look at the, um, grab the first three children of body, which again are the three divs, mm -hmm. uh, and then set the on click function to get bigger. That's right. And because the function is defined, is all of its behaviors defined with, uh, with respect to this, um, it's going to execute that behavior on whatever object it's attached to uh, when it executes. Actually, that's an important point about this. This, its value is determined at runtime. When the function executes is when this finds out what it is. That can sometimes lead to confusion. Because if you don't keep track of where the function is and what it's attached to, you may think you're referring to one thing, but you may in fact be referring to something else. So be cognizant of that, because it is a hole that people will fall into with this. Actually, so um, Peter, you mentioned um, what are what are use cases when we might want to uh, combine objects? And I didn't think of it at the time, but actually, this is a great example. Wouldn't it be nice if I could just say combine document.body.children.i.style, comma, background color, red, height, 100 pixels, width, 100 pixels, margin, 10 pixels. I just set all those properties in one fell swoop. Anyway, that's apropos to nothing. Yes, I, I assume so. I do not do the recording, Snaz, but um, we someone one of us has it. <laughs> and so we'll we'll share that out. Okay. It's uh, five forty, so actually we're a little bit late. I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, any other questions? I, I think we're gonna be jumping into stand ups shortly. Um, but but while we're while we're um, getting that ready, are there any more questions? Any final questions that you guys want to touch on um, before we move in? Go ahead and call them out. It's fine. People aren't like clamoring. Uh, but you will need to come off mic. I mean on mic rather. Man, we are 20 minutes away from uh, the end of the week. What do you expect? Well, fair enough. You guys are going to have a uh, fun homework. For t oh, speaking of which. Um, OK, well, if you guys don't have any questions, uh, I need to push tonight's homework. So I'm going to do that. Um, and then we're going to jump into uh, breakout rooms as soon as uh, that's all ready. They're ready. <laughs> Cool. Thanks, Christine.